So good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to this seminar organized by the Independent Research Group for Global Health Justice in collaboration with the Center for Research and Ethics. Je suis Riwa Chang, professeur à l'Université de Montréal et co-directrice du Centre de recherche en éthique avec ma consoeur, professeur Christine Voigt de l'Université McGill et euh, Valérie Giroux, euh, notre directrice euh, adjointe. Il nous fait grand plaisir d'accueillir cette première collaboration entre le Independent Research Group for Global Health Justice et le Centre de recherche en éthique. Et donc, sans plus tarder, je cède la parole à notre conférencière invitée, Dr. Teresa Handel, et euh, notre collègue qui animera euh, euh, l'événement, Dr. Sridhar Vekantapura. Merci. Thank you very much, Rio. And so I want to start first by thanking our colleagues at the University of Montreal and in Cray. I don't know how to say that in French, but uh, I want to really sort of say my gratitude to all the colleagues who've um, helped with bringing this together. And I look forward to our joint seminars over the coming months. Um, to some of you, I think I recognize many of you, and there might be some of you that uh, may not be aware of our International Resource Group for Global Health Justice group of individuals. So I just want to take a couple of minutes explaining what we do and who we are before uh, I introduce Teresa and the subject for today. Um, about two years ago, in response to the COVID pandemic, um, a bunch of political philosophers who are interested in health and also global justice and health um, came together in order to do three things. One is to help with the global COVID response. If you remember in 2020, there was this idea that there was going to be one unified coordinated, globally interconnected and solidaristic response to the global pandemic. Um, and there was various kinds of institutions that were created, namely this something called ACT Accelerator, uh, which had different pillars of which the COVAX is one. And the idea was to be able to, uh, in our role as sort of philosophers, particularly around global equity and justice, be able to help in that sort of response. Um, and so, As time has gone on, as you probably are aware, um, that sort of one global response was actually quite superficial and underneath there was very much multiple responses that were being planned and forged ahead. Nevertheless, um, the institution of uh, ACT Accelerator and COVAX has still continued and persisted. And uh, some of us have been contributing to the global responses in different ways. We've been volunteering for different panels, different committees, et cetera, at a global level, particularly at the WHO. We've also, over the last two years, had some conversations with individuals at these international organizations and asking if how we can help or sort of discuss various issues that they are working on. The second uh, area that um, I particularly am quite uh, happy and excited and passionate about is this idea of us identifying issues that others may not see or others may not want to see or want to say anything about. And so one of the issues here is, for example, at an international level, when the WHO is essentially an organization created by nation states, for nation states, there might be various issues that the WHO does not want to raise because it would not necessarily pass through committee, let's say. And I think that that's one of the roles that we have seen is that we're able to talk about issues that are important but may not get um, sort of wide uh, sort of advocacy or recognition because of the geopolitical context of what's going on. And the third sort of aim and goal of our group is to be able to engender public deliberation so that individuals who are very well aware and capable of identifying these issues and understanding them are able to be more capable as a result of our seminars about our activities to sort of um, bring a richer discussion and also take control of some of the issues that they may not have had before because they're sort of seen as technical issues or they're seen as political problems. But something that we think is really important is that citizens take sort of uh, ownership of some of the issues as well. So today we are doing sort of goal number two and three all at once, which is that we are talking and learning about the various kinds of health justice issues in relation to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Um, and it is something that um, some people find 
hard to connect the idea of COVID response or pandemic with the Ukraine invasion. Um, and so I just want to make a sort of quick bridge to that. And I would start by saying that when the Soviet Union uh, <coughs> disintegrated, fell apart, or however you want to say it, dismantled, a lot of people thought that this was um, the end of a story and that this was sort of the um, sort of, you know, end of communism and then also that democracy won. But if you were interested in health and public health, you would have been paying attention to the enormous health consequences of that dismantling of the Soviet Union. There was an enormous rise in alcoholism and suicides. There were two massive um, issues around uh, a great epidemic of TB, particularly MDR-TB in Russian prisons. There was also a massive pandemic of HIV AIDS. And a lot of these health issues were not addressed su sufficiently, nor were they taken seriously, and there's lots of consequences. What we know very little about is what was happening in the Eastern European former Soviet republics. Um, what we do know over the last five years, and particularly as a result of the pandemic, is that um, there is great government distrust regarding health, particularly vaccines. Ukraine has one of the lowest uh, vaccination rates in Eastern Europe, and there is great amount of health issues in Eastern Europe uh, European countries that are often not well addressed because they're often uh, overwhelmed or dominated by information about what's happening in Europe or in Russia, but we sort of skip over Eastern Europe in a variety of different ways. So with that, I think that it brings me great pleasure to introduce to you um, Dr. Teresa Hendel, who's going to be speaking about um, both the Russian imperialist history, the impact on Eastern European countries, uh, and anything else that she thinks that we ought to know, and I'm very excited about that. So to introduce her, uh, Dr. Teresa Hendel is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oxford, uh, Augsburg, <laughs> research associate at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, um, and uh, quite importantly, the founder of the Central and Eastern European Feminist Research Network, which is an interdisciplinary group of individuals, feminists, who are uh, concerned about the situation in Eastern Europe in a variety of ways. So the format of today will be that um, Dr. Hendel will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then um, I will sort of ask a couple of questions, and then we'll ask the members of the uh, urge group, as we call it. it. They get first dibs on some comments and questions, and then we'll move on to an open discussion. Um, and you are welcome to both ask questions and have responses or comments. I think that that's the only way to keep it. We don't need to sort of try to force you to just ask questions. Um, so with that, I have uh, 3.43 where I am, Teresa. So you have about 20, 25 minutes, and I will uh, try to, if you are going over time, which um, I hope you do, because that means you have lots to say, um, <laughs> I will gently, um, gently nudge you into sort of bringing it to the question and answer session. So over to you. Okay. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be here. I will share my slides because I actually have a presentation. Um, So I was asked um, to speak about, um, to respond to um, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia from a global health perspective. And in doing it, it's my absolute intention to center the debate about on the suffering that um, Ukrainians are going through because they are the first and foremost affected population. And then I also want to point to the broader and wider impact um, of um, Russian military violence. First of all, I wanted to comment on how um, the invasion has been uh, reported on um, very often in, in the press and in um, global discussions. And it often is framed as a war or a conflict. And it sort of gives an impression that there are two sides that are fighting each other or there's some sort of conflict may be um, natural to a troubled um, piece of land. And I think that this kind of framing is really concealing um, a number of um, things that we should be concerned about. And one of them is the power dynamic of this military aggression. 
Um, it started as a military invasion, which is which is um, important. Um, it also conceals the fact that this is not an isolated incident of Russian aggression against Ukraine. There's a history, and I will come back to it. There is also a broader context of Russian imperial and colonial violence that this framing does not pay attention to or account for. And um, the intergenerational impact of the ongoing legacy of um, Russian imperialism and colonialism. And not seeing these issues, um, I, um, I see that um, this really perpetuates several um, shortcomings and failures. Um, and first and foremost, without grasping and accounting for the power dynamic and socio-historical and political context of this violence, there is little chance for justice, health, or well-being for the affected populations. So we need to pay attention to this. First of all, um, this um, act of aggression um, is a military invasion of a sovereign state. Russia invaded Ukraine on uh, February 24, but it also is an escalation of a longer conflict because it's an ongoing invasion that started in 2014 with the occupation of Crimea and Donbass. And there has been much evidence um, of the violence that has been ongoing in, in those uh, parts of Ukraine, um, including sexual violence and repression of resistance. And to understand this is crucial because when we understand that, it really makes us um, able to better understand Ukrainians when they refuse the largely Western notion that appeasement of Russia and so-called peace in um, Ukraine in the form of surrender um, will benefit Ukrainians. They strongly disagree with that and they've seen um, the very opposite of it happening in Donbass and Crimea. And um, the power analysis and um, seeing also accounting for the evidence of harm also will allow us to see that there has been no peace, but um, rather oppression and occupation um, by an oppressive state in, in, in the history of Russian invasions of Ukraine and other countries. And indeed, the um, Russian violence against Ukraine has a long history. Uh, one of the most um, tragic parts of this history is the so-called Holodomor, which is a Soviet genocidal famine that um, killed uh, approximately 3.5 to 5 million uh, people in Ukraine. Um, here is some art by Maria Primachenko that is, who was an artist and her art is often seen as this beautiful naive art, but when you look closer, it's actually all about um, the suffering from famine. There is also a much broader context of Russian imperial and colonial violence. Um, it is an ongoing and repeating pattern. On the left, you have Chechnya, and on the right, you have um, Ukraine. In 2022, we could find similar um, images from Syria as well. Here is a history of um, Soviet occupations in um, East Central Europe, um, which was very um, wide and rich history of military invasions and oppression of um, sovereign states and nations. And the history goes much, much um, back to Russian imperial conquests. Um, here you see a map. Um, um, and this is often not um, recognized that um, Russia um, has colonized um, Central and North Asia. Um, and these conquests go back to the 16th century where um, Central Asian empires were conquered by Russian emperors and um, their borders were redrawn by the Soviets um, later um, and um, to create five countries that still exist today, which is Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Um, and in the second half of um, the 19th century, the Russian Empire colonized the Kazakh um, steppe and with Slavic settlers and um, erected legal and administrative institutions of power over um, indigenous Kazakh nomads. 
and also um, orchestrated a famine on their lands, which killed 1.5 um, million people. Um, Marina Tlostanova, who is an indigenous scholar from Central Asia, um, argues that the Soviet empire has always been racist, Eurocentric, and patriarchal in spite of its rhetoric. And just like um, several uh, predominantly West European nations, the Soviet Union also perpetrated genocidal violence and colonial oppression of indigenous nations in Siberia. Here are some of the names of those who tried to break free and were met with brutal violence. And there has been no apology, reparations, justice, or peace, or not even an acknowledgement of this systemic wrongdoing and harm uh, from the perpetrator. So this um, also calls um, for the broadening of the relevant debates to ensure that debates about um, colonialism actually capture this kind of suffering, because so far, um, the dominant conceptualization of colonialism as something that is an overseas endeavor and it involves both does not actually account uh, for the suffering of um, people who are colonized by Russia and the indigenous nations who, who actually uh, face ongoing uh, persecution and violence in Russia land. Um, and um, when we think about the current um, ongoing invasion, we think about how social determinants um, and social conditions impact on the capability of, of people to be healthy. Um, one can see how um, the invasion of Ukraine is undermining um, one's capacity for physical um, and mental health. And, um, Julian uh, Schieter, a uh, specialist advisor in ethics and human rights at the British Medical Association, wrote a commentary on this saying that um, health impacts of military aggression um, are broad and severe and they do not stop with trauma from the fighting. Um, crude estimates suggest that for each person killed directly by war, nine will be killed indirectly. And we can expect that this will be worsened by Russian war crimes, um, such as the destruction of civilian infrastructure and health uh, care facilities. And indeed, in the middle of an ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the mental health effects will also be serious and enduring. Um, now I cite, um, the Ukrainian people have been living with anxiety about the intention of its powerful neighbor for many years. Those directly caught up in the conflict will be at immediate risk of post-traumatic stress disorder, um, depression, anxiety, and other stress-related conditions, including substance abuse, and also, um, once again, this may have long and even intergenerational um, impact. He also clarifies that we have much evidence that the health effects of war can be displaced far beyond borders through the displacement of people fleeing war zones who indeed take their trauma with them. And on these migrant groups, they suffer infectious diseases and struggle to find nutritious food and housing that can support health. He also observes that um, war is known to destroy more than bodies and minds, also human well-being and community, bonds between people and places, and it leaves an enduring legacy. And traumatic memory um, can make the search for peace impossible, because without peace there can be no real hope of human health or flourishing. The invasion is not just a tragedy for today's Ukrainians, it will also lie heavily on the well-being on the future generations. And to me, one of the questions also is how this trauma um, that is currently in the making from the invasion might be intersecting with the trauma from the past genocidal violence. Um, intergenerational transmission of trauma was first noted in 1966 when clinicians in Canada observed high numbers of children of Holocaust survivors born after World War II seeking treatment. And there's been um, a growing pool of research that has looking on the transgenerational transmission of trauma in the context of the Holodomor. Um, Zasekina and her colleagues conducted a um, comparative study with um, specifically with women survivors of the Holocaust and the Holodomor, and they found similar um, impact and issues they found that many participants in the Ukrainian sample 
noted that there was a lot of suffering and pain in their families, fear, anger, and outrage, and the key emotion in um, mothers and daughters' um, memories about their family experience of the Holodomor is chronic anxiety, um, and that something might terrible might happen. Um, the long-term fear of reoccurrence of genocide um, is something that is shared and um, similarly observed in Holocaust survivors. Both population samples also share anxiety related to food and the possibility of starving and dying again. Dying again. And um, the descendants of um, Holodomor survivors also experience fear um, of uncertainty and lack of um, security in Ukraine which is now sadly um, being increasingly materialized um, and concerns arise how um, the old trauma um, will be exacerbated um, by the trauma from current um, genocidal violence, which has, um, there has been a debate um, with um, some leading scholars of, of um, Holocaust and genocide, such as Eugene Finkel, arguing that at this stage there is enough evidence that um, the Russian violence in Ukraine is genocidal, that there is an intention um, to eradicate um, Ukrainians, if not um, all of them, then at least some in part, which fits the um, genocide convention, um, the Russian propaganda, recently um, turned into uh, calls for um, genocide and, er and eradication of those who are Ukrainians who are resisting. And Ukrainian um, philosopher um, Volodymyr Yermolenko actually in this context talks about um, Russian Nazism. And it's quite interesting what he says because he points out that Russian Nazism works differently than um, German Nazism. He explains that while um, to um, German Nazis, Jews were the other who wanted to be like them and therefore they need to be eradicated. Ukrainians for Russians are like Russians, which now want to be the other. And that is why they need to be exterminated because they, are, um, they do not want to be in the Russian brotherhood. They do not want to be Russian. This is also how genocides have functioned under the Soviet Union. The Soviet people were meant to be a melting pot that would swallow various people and groups and assimilate, assimilate them into one kind of Soviet people, as I already noted. And many of the nations and population groups who refused to be assimilated were in parts exterminated because they were trying to maintain sovereignty and agency. Ermolenko's analysis illustrates well the understanding of race also not as a scientifically um, unsubstantiated um, notion of a biological category, but a technology of management of human difference um, reinforced, reinforcing um, supremacy, white supremacy and control of the population um, as both Stuart Hall and Anna Linton or Ruha Benjamin have theorized before. It is also that the Russian genocidal violence has a significant gender dimension. There are disturbing reports of sexual violence and the weaponization of rape um, as a weapon of um, military aggression and ethnic cleansing. Um, Ukraine's human rights ombudsman, um, Lyudmila Denisova, reported, for example, that in Bucha, 25 girls and women aged 14 to 24 were held in a basement by Russian soldiers who threatened to rape them to the point where they wouldn't want sexual contact with any man to prevent them from having Ukrainian children, which raises concerns about ethnic cleansing. Nine of them are now pregnant. And this is just one of the many cases of what has emerged as a pattern. Indeed, the use of rape as a weapon by Russian soldiers had previously um, been evidenced in uh, Crimea and Donbas under occupation or military aggression in Chechnya, but also during the occupation of Czechoslovakia in 1968. And I have once written a textbook chapter on the weaponization of rape in that context. There has also been um, concern about um, anti-LGBTIQ violence 
uh, from Russian occupiers, particularly following the Antigi uh, purges in Chechnya um, that have been perpetuated between 2017 and 2019, um, which some have called a genocidal attack against gay and bisexual men and um, Ukrainian LGBTI plus uh, people are currently actively resisting um, the invasion because they're afraid um, that same uh, fate might, um, they might face same violence. Teresa, I'm going to use this opportunity mm -hmm. to tell you that there's five minutes or so left. I am aware of that. <laughs> um, and also, could you, there, there seems to be some papers and a microphone interaction. Okay. If you okay. could just I'll try to minimize that. Thank you. So um, it remains to be seen how you know the trauma from the past will um, intersect with the trauma that is currently in the making. But I also wanted to point out at what um, the debates that have been sparked about the broader trauma in um, people who have been um, subjected to similar. Um, imperial violence. And um, there have been some Lithuanian um, illustrators um, who have um, responded to the Russian invasion with accounts of what they have been through and what, what um, that sparked in their families and, and uh, family histories. And I do not mean to equate their trauma with the trauma of um, Ukrainians, but I want to point out that there is a wider context and that um, Russian invasion also invasions also affect those who have um, suffered from them in the past and who have anxiety about Russian violence, indeed in a context where Russia keeps making threats and, and um, they just violence against um, various societies. So here, Lithuanian illustrator um, Sabaite is um, describing the stories of women and her family um, generations of women who have um, suffered from Russian um, uh, invasions. She re uh, remembers her great grandmother who was deported to Siberia by the Soviets, her grandma um, who was carried off the Soviet Union because it killed her cousin, her mother who endured the occupation and was so happy to see the fall of the Soviet Union and herself who was born under the Soviet regime and who saw um, its tanks and they're written into her memories and nightmares. And she basically says that she's try tired of this cycle of aggression and through her four generations of women shout um, hands of Ukraine. And I strongly relate that through my own family um, ancestral stories. Another um, illustrator, Ula uh, Rubite, speaks of a rage of generations um, who are witnessing yet another manifestation of aggression and the worsening of the impact on Ukrainians who have already seen the worst. In her view, Lithuanians see Ukrainians resisting their invasion and understand that they're also fighting for them and they wonder if they might be next. She also states that she believes that there are um, there's collective danger, um, no matter if the bombs fall 300 or three kilometers away from us. And remembers her um, great grandmother, whose greatest um, loathing was always directed at the Russian regime, and her biggest fear was Putin starting war. And she sees similar um, stories, um, disturbing perils with Ukraine when she remembers her mother's, her grandmother's stories about Russian soldiers raping women, stealing, killing, and destroying everything. And she says that uh, Putin's actions have awakened in her a collective memory of torture. She never knew she was sleeping with, within her. But it also set up a rage deep inside her, a rage of generations, a level of unacceptable that cannot be set through, a rage that she knows she is not alone in experiencing. And this I have seen in, in a lot of debates recently in my own networks. And I think I have, have little time, but I just wanted to also tell you that in some, the, the violence um, of invasions, 
the trauma led to uh, suicides and also to protest suicides. And there is a whole um, list. This is not even complete. Um, so many, mainly men, um, immolated themselves um, in response to um, Soviet invasion um, and populations that have been affected by them. And there is a research on um, suicides in, in um, Lithuania and how they would rise um, in um, response to Russian um, or Soviet invasions, mainly in men again. And in Ukraine currently we know of uh, suicides among um, victims of Russian sexual violence, mainly elderly women who, who were either um, executed or they took their own life because they couldn't um, deal with the sexual violence or they didn't want to live after rape. And um, in this context, I want to note um, a concept by Maria Merchik and Olga Plakotnik of um, the buffer periphery, which I think we need to ask um, about the sort of impact on mental health. Um, they argue that um, Russian imperialism positions Ukraine as its own little province, uh, while the hegemony of Western imperialism positions Ukraine as a not fully modernized civilized periphery of Europe, which has been corrupted by the Soviet regime and then left to the normalizing processes of democratization of European, Europeanization and yet is framed as hopelessly lagging behind. And between these two rival imperial centers, Ukraine appears as a borderland, a buffer. Um, it's wild peoples and territories observed by so many outsiders have been tempered by its proximity to those civilized observers. And in economic terms for both imperial centers, the main value of Ukraine is to provide a cheap labor force for construction agriculture, care work, and sex service for first-class Western and Russian citizens. And in regards to health, I want to ask and investigate what is the impact of being in and from the buffer periphery? What does it do um, to one's health and conditions? And what are the implications for one's um, well-being? And I think this also concerns those who managed to run away um, from the Russian invasion. And we need to ask ourselves, what kind of socioeconomic conditions do these people um, run towards? Um, you might have noticed that the invasion has been described in Western media as involving relatively European and relatively civilized um, refugees. And um, many um, scholars from um, Europe's East actually pointed out at the structures within which Ukrainians have been racialized and exploited and treated as almost European, but not quite, and not um, really white either. And they're racialized as providers, as cheap labor, which we can also observe on the fact that they have had some of the highest mortality rate from COVID because they have been in the kind of employment uh, where people are um, exploited under um, unhealthy conditions where they are more likely to actually um, get sick with COVID. And Ukrainian women have been um, sexualized um, and exploited, which is also now being um, seriously um, problematic um, as they are fleeing and they're, um, being, um, they're being in risk from trafficking. And the kind of notion of solidarity uh, with Ukrainian refugees is also problematized by the fact that it is not offered equally to all Ukrainians who are fleeing. And we see that not only on um, students who are running from Ukraine, um, African and Indian students, but we also see discrimination, systemic discrimination of Ukrainian Roma. Um, and this is something that um, is yet to be seen how this will impact um, in the long run. And this is just my final uh, point because I think that we also need to start um, being concerned about what is happening 
in uh, Russia and how Russia is becoming increasingly totalitarian and is exacerbating the racial oppression of population in the Russian Federation. And many scholars, um, indigenous scholars and decolonial scholars have pointed out that Russia is a white um, empire and um, it is race-based and it is oppressive towards um, indigenous populations. And currently being Russian means being white and Slavic and everyone else who doesn't want to be Russian or who isn't white and Slavic is increasingly being subjected um, to oppression. And I think that this is also something that we need to be concerned about. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Hendel. That was um, extraordinary. Um, I have to admit upfront that I have been ignorant of most of those uh, points of information. And so I really have been sort of trying to uh, take it all in. So I guess, uh, let me just uh, take the first opportunity to ask some questions uh, about, uh, about what you just presented. Um, what comes out in, what comes out for me in listening to your talk are three things. One is this idea of intergenerational trauma and that this is not a small conflict, uh, war, it's not even, you know, invasion. This is not a small event. Mm -hmm. Um, this is actually going to be, uh, uh, sort of something that happens with harms that happen for generations. And also because of our globalized world and the refugee <laughs> of different countries, this is going to be also disseminated across the world, these harms and the generations of people that are their stuff. So that was one point. And the second one, I think that's also been really under um, sort of recognized is essentially the impact on girls and women. And you brought this out, I think, significantly. Um, and I think that it's not only the, the question about sexual violence that sort of most affected me, it's also this idea of starvation, which I mm -hmm. think has a very particular gendered impact because of gender roles around feeding your family and feeding your children and having your children starve. And, and I think that's been underexamined in lots of places, but, but that I thought, you know, was also interesting. And the last one I think is probably the most difficult one, which is the, you know, m there was a lot of response to the news headlines and really some stupid things that some journalists said, some things like, this is like Europe, they're just like us. I can't believe it. This is so shocking. Uh, it's happening to them. It's happening to people like us which shows sort of some sort of implicit notion that this is an abnormal situation for people like us, but those people like over there, they constantly deal with this. But I think what was missing, even in their responses, but also the race, uh, you know, the people who were sort of decrying racism, oh. is this idea that the world cares about Ukraine largely because uh, there is a power behind it that they're afraid of. So what you're talking about, the buffer, notion so people don't care about sort of a country in you know southeast asia or africa if there's no if it's not playing some sort of geopolitical role that people are concerned about um so i thought that was really yeah. something and i don't know if it's unique to you you know the eastern european countries or ukraine but this idea of um you know being a you know living life out in a place of where you're thought of as a buffer between um, sort of stuff. But yeah, so those are the three things. I guess um, my my kind of question based on ignorance is, and this is my, as you can see, I am not white. And so I am used to seeing things as in white people and non-white people. What you've done is make me question about how white people, as I see them, recognize each other. Uh, and I am... Um, I am confused. Let's let's say it that way. So so how how does how does um, uh, racism 
so I understand the imperialism bit. I understand the culture bit. So, you know, I understand the domination and all that stuff. But I'm, I'm interested in how does racism work uh, it conceptually in, in the, in the so, as you said, in the Russian imagination? Yeah, so I think that um, I would maybe start even from like a broader um, perspective on how racism works in Europe, because when you look at um, critical race theory that is coming from um, scholars um, who are from Eastern and Eastern Europe, they actually speak of hierarchies of whiteness and various shades of whiteness and not not actually seeing uh, whiteness as a homogeneous category. And they're arguing that basically Western whiteness and Eastern whiteness are very different and are treated very differently. Um, and um, of course the sort of binaries or like boundaries of who counts as white are, are constantly shifting um, depending on which context you're in and, and also, um, with respect to um, class, I, would, I also um, um, would say. And um, there is scholarship that looks at um, something called racial triangulation, how the, those who are in the periphery um, um, or semi-periphery, semi somewhere in between, which is where um, the buffer zone has um, been placed, how they're racialized um, in relation to um, the superior um, Western um, white people, and then to those uh, who are the have been um, sort of constructed as a subaltern, and those would be um, people who were colonized by by uh, Western European countries, and so it's always in this uh, sort of dynamic relationship, um, which is not actually captured captured by the kind of like. Um, binary view of like whiteness and and um, um, sort of like black and white um, um, binary thinking about um, racialization and race and this is this is um, very much um, a pool of scholarship that has been um, developed um, in the last two decades most strongly and it's it's a really interesting line of work. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And so let me see if um, members of the, you know, urge group um, get first dibs on the comments and questions. So should we, uh, do we have any hands for comments or questions? So I see one. Let me see if I see any more. I've got two. Anyone else? I've got three. Actually, yeah. can I just add one more thing? Because, because I find it important to also say that um, the shifting sort of boundaries of like who is considered European and, and white are also very much um, implemented within Central and Eastern Europe. So we sort of do it to each other as well. So I wanted yeah. to critique that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's do, uh, so we've got three questions and so we'll do one at a time. Um, and we've got, as some, somebody nicely said, we've got acres of time in front of us. So, you know, so mm. let's see how well we do with keeping time. So I have Anna, Joe, and then Alison. So first, Anna. Okay, the one, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation, really super interesting. So I have a few remarks. So f first, um, th this, this story about Russia and uh, other ethnicities. I just wanted to know whether you have um, any thoughts about the fact that, of course, you, I, of course, I agree with everything you said about small ethnic minorities in Russia, but at the same time, from the genocide point of view, we also know that Russia was the first big country that helped the Armenians. So this is, is a very interesting moment where Russia is really a heroic country for most of the Armenians today, of the survivors of the genocide by, by Turkey. So this is this is a tricky, I, I'm just currently working on the genocide and whether we can use this word or not. So, so this is where I started to, to struggle and I felt it 
found it quite challenging. So um, then the um, there's another another issue that I think uh, that I think is in, important. So um, you both said you and Trida that people care about Ukraine because they are afraid of Russia and maybe it's close and nobody cares about other countries. I don't think that things are as, as straightforward. I think that um, this conf the, the current invasion uh, in, re uh, brings us back to something which is quite nice uh, in a way conceptually. We know who is the bad person, I mean where the evil is, and we know who are good people. And it is not as simple in most of the countries. I mean, with Yemen, we just don't know what to do. We, we have no idea how to deal with Afghanistan. We just have our hands are tied. We, the US tried and obviously failed in Afghanistan, or uh, I don't even mention Yemen, which is which is a country I particularly uh, like and care about. And there is, you know, here, it's much easier to, to, to see where, where things are, uh, what should be done in a way. So this is why I think we care that much because it's, uh, it's easier conceptually. And I don't think that it's, it's morally wrong to care about this because it's, if we can do something at least here, let's do something at least here, right? Thank you. Thanks for uh, actually letting me know about this um, um, concern of Armenians, because I must say that that is something that I am not ever enough um, about. So I will look into this now, because that's something that escaped my attention. Great. Yeah. Joe? Oh, sorry, Teresa, did you want to say more? No, I was just thinking, I've, I, I don't have, maybe it will come to me because I don't have any immediate Oh, there is yeah. okay joe so that that was really wonderful um yeah like Srila, there's a lot there that i didn't know about i thought i was reasonably well informed but it turns out that i'm not so so in a way that's both good and bad i suppose to find that out um i want to go back to one of the things you said close to the beginning about um the children of holocaust survivors and the intergenerational mm -hmm. trauma um and you know, I, I think probably many people will be responding to this from their own personal circumstances. So that is my own situation. Um, but it also made me wonder, um, because we you know, we use the term Holocaust survivor very generally. And there are, you know, there are very there are a number of different situations in which one could be a Holocaust survivor. So you could have gone through the camps, or in my own case, my father was on the kinder transport. So his trauma was very different. So his trauma was a trauma of separation and complete bafflement, you know, rather than um, yeah, having gone through a trauma of, yeah, he never went hungry. You know, he, he was brought up by a wealthy Christian woman in the UK. So in some by some standards, he had a very good life. Um, but you know, he also had mental health problems, and some of my brothers have as well. So you know, maybe maybe that's an interesting thing. But you know, I've heard about this research. I haven't looked at it myself, but I just wondered whether there was much differentiation in different types of Holocaust survivor, or whether the you know, the category was just used in this sort of you know, portfolio sense. No, there is, there is. But I must say that I'm. Um increasingly sort of diving into it. So I, I I don't think that I have enough of an analysis to, to offer right now because I'm, but I, the ones that I uh, referenced were actually um, people who went through through camps. Yeah. So there was the, there was, as you said, the, the fear of hunger and like um, starving and running out of food um, where it really intersected with the experiences of a famine. Yeah, but thank you so much because this is really important to carefully differentiate between people who went through different experiences. I mean, I, I would expect that there was there is intergenerational trauma in all cases, mm -hmm. but it would be you know, quite an interesting hypothesis to see if it's somewhat different mm -hmm. for um, and you know whether that research has has been done. Anyway, that, that's enough. I'll, I'll pass on to the next. I've, I've found a lot, so I, I will I will definitely um, look into this more closely because I found a whole um, mm. growing um, line of research, and I think it's also what what the research shows is just how 
obviously how long it took for um, some people to actually speak because it, it sounds like a lot of survivors started speaking when they were very old and shortly before actually dying. So um, I think that there's a much more, much more research now um, because of the time that um, has passed. But well, just to follow up from that, so I think that's right, that, that there was an attempt to bury the past. Um, but also, I think um, you, as a child, you don't know what's normal and what's not normal. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I'd heard about in my father's family history. Um, but yeah, if someone had told me there were 10 million people in the UK who had the same family history, you know, I would have believed it. So you, you don't always realize that things are unusual if you're growing up with them. And it's, so it's only later in life that you can get that uh, mm -hmm. round of perspective on it as well. Thanks, Alison. You're muted. Sorry, um, I wanted to begin by thanking you. It was just very illuminating for me. And um, there is, as I, as I said at the beginning, it's not even um, particular facts that you imparted, at least for me, such as, you know, racialization among so-called whites. It's the framing of it which I find really uh, helpful. So I'm a person whose um, politics are pretty much on the left. So at the beginning of this invasion, I was listening to um, for NATO blaming. Um, and so uh, Russia was seen as um, a country that was backed into a corner by the aggressive West who kept um, gobbling up Eastern European nations in uh, NATO. So that's uh, one framing. Another framing that uh, you hear a lot on the West is, this is a battle between democracy and authoritarianism. And you know, there's ways of filling out that diagnosis too. A third framing that I've seen is in terms of uh, gender broadly construed and uh, the Putin and, 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 and conservative religion, seemingly the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, support for the so-called traditional family um, against uh, you know, anything perceived as gender bending and so on. So I've seen all these um, framings applied to try and make sense of this broader global situation. And I'm personally particularly interested in the third, but again, other people have confessed their ignorance. And I too really didn't know much about Ukraine at all. So I've been trying to learn but you've just taught me so much about, you know, its uh, um, situation as a buffer state. Um, in trying to look up hastily, remedy my ignorance about Ukraine. Um, I mean, I didn't know it was such a large territorial country. It's enormous. It's like almost the largest in Europe. Other than Russia. And I wanted to something like Britain, where I was brought up. So I looked up its population, and um, it reached a height of about, um, well, you know this, 50 million in about, uh, I don't know, 1960, let's say. And since then, its population has been declining. So it looks like things have been going downhill a lot for Ukraine for a very long time. Uh, you know, if you think about it, it's already 30 years since the Soviet Union collapsed. But even so, um, there's been 
um, a decrease in longevity, um, poverty, and huge amounts of migration. I was amazed to discover that the largest emigre population of Ukrainians is actually in the US, not in Russia. So uh, clearly the invasion is making things a lot worse, but it's making things um, pretty bad uh, to begin with. Um, as though there are chronic structural things even prior to the invasion. Would you like to comment on that? And I'm sorry if it's a very ignorant question. Um, can you just uh, repeat the question because I couldn't, uh, the question part I didn't catch. Sorry. Um, it looked like um, the health situation in Ukraine has been going Okay. downhill for a very okay. long time um and so the um the invasion mm. from the perspective of someone who's ignorant looks like it's uh, just accentuated something that was mm. already not very nice good so this is something also that i'm um trying to familiarize myself with but yulia yurchenko who's a um, political um uh, economist and scientist, she actually wrote a book about, um, I think it's called Ukraine as an empire of capital or the empire of capital. And she actually shows how um, global financial institutions um, pushed Ukraine into introducing or implementing the kind of neoliberalism that actually impoverished it um, enormously. And that like she shows that before this happened, Ukraine had an economy um, comparable with France and now it is the poorest country of Europe. So she shows how um, neoliberalism, and this is actually something, there's a lot of research coming out um, on this in um, across um, Eastern and Eastern Europe about how neoliberalism actually plundered um, the countries and how contrary to popular belief um, that capitalism um, saved people from uh, state organized socialism, how it actually benefited quite a small minority um, of the population and how a lot of um, a lot of the populations actually struggled and sort of like the social um, stability and um, security um, got decreased. And I found it actually quite interesting on the graph when I was showing the Lithuanian suicide that um, this is something that I want to just look into more closely to be certain and look into various explanations of it. But the suicide actually rose enormously after Lithuania gained um, independence. And I wonder if that also came from the kind of loss of um, stability and then, then worry about the socioeconomic impact of um, the fall of the old regime. And what was really interesting was when the suicide rate went really high, the moment when it started falling was when Lithuania joined the EU and NATO. And this is what I would say to everyone who wants to um, blame NATO right now and shift um, the sort of attention and responsibility from the perpetrator of um, imperialism, which is Russia when it comes to Ukraine, um, because that is the army that is killing um, and um, raping and uh, perpetrating genocide right now. That actually in Lithuania, um, following um, the um, joining of NATO, the suicide rates fell by 47%. And so that tells us something about um, the sort of maybe feeling of safety and, and uh, the sort of lowering of um, anxiety that you are in a buffer zone. And Lithuania went through two different um, occupations uh, by the Soviet Union. So the, the living in this space where you're between two um, empires and um, the one that has been a serial perpetrator of um, invasions and military aggression can just 
roll over you and and uh, you know regularly um kill a few um hundreds of thousands and millions of people and one never knows um what their future will be and how stable that will be that that is really a profound issue from from my um perspective and i want to be also very much critical of nato but i think that we also what what i find really troubling is how narrow um, and one-sided that perspective is because I think that also one organization can have different role and different impact in different places around the world and it also needs to be seen through that sort of um, perspective and especially in in a moment when we see that um, Ukrainians are asking for help and nobody is helping because they are not NATO members. <laughs> so um, if we want to also critique NATO, I would like people who, before they do that to actually come up with offers um, of some sort of realistic um, suggestions of how they want to protect life of those people who are actually threatened um, and have been threatened and have been impacted by um, by histories of um, Russian imperialism. And I, I don't see that um, care <laughs> um, in, in those debates. That really concerns well. me. And I think the whole discourse about shifting responsibility, like when we think about, um, for example, perpetration, like perpetrating of abuse, um, you know, it's the kind of discourse of someone um, made him do it, or and it's it's when when you look at it from that perspective, it's absurd. Um, the lack of attributing responsibility um, in these debates is something that I find really problematic, and also the lack of um, the kind of um, erasure of agency and self-determination of those people who are concerned because we also need to understand that they make decisions for themselves and um, they have joined various you know organizations um, different societies on their own uh, wishes because they felt endangered and threatened and now we're seeing it with Sweden and Finland because within six weeks um, of Russian aggression, um, those populations decided that that is their option of the best, best sort of options for um, safety or, you know, um, the kind of um, guarantee also of um, more international and transnational response if they were to be attacked, which Ukraine, it, it it has some sort of care, but uh, the fact that um, we are not seeing much action to actually um, help defend people um, from invasion um, is also concerning. And what particularly concerns me is um, there have been several feminist manifestos that have been written about this um, situation. And I was particularly disappointed that um, scholars who have been my inspiration and role models um, in regards to thinking about power and, and abuse and um, challenging um, structural injustice have signed manifestos that basically say that um, frame this invasion as some war that we need to respond with calls for peace and also calls for actually not helping Ukraine defend itself. Code and pink. I find it hugely problematic because one needs to defend themselves when they're attacked and against violence. Well, thank you so much. There's a tremendous lot more I'd like to ask in response, but I can see Nicole has her hand up. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't spoken much on this and I'm sorry I was late, so I probably missed all the relevant bits, but like there does, I'm a pacifist, right? Like uh, ultimately, so so there does seem to be like this, this tragedy that's going on that I have a hard time dealing with. And so 
Um, I just feel like if I was in Ukraine, the thing I'd want is them to hand the keys to the Russians. Like, I understand how bad it is to be in Russia, like, and how bad it would have to be to be Russian. But like, that's what I would want for my family, because although it's really horrible, it's much better than like what's happening and what will happen in the future for the foreseeable term, given the likely consequences. I think it's it's going to devastate the country and take a long time to recover. And it's not like Russia's not going to win anyway. So from like a purely consequentialist perspective, just from the Ukrainian perspective, I can see the argument for like being like, please just make me Russian now. Um, and I wonder like what to what extent it's like being in other parts of Eastern Europe that influences this, because obviously like if I was in Poland, <laughs> I, would, I would not feel the same way. Um, uh, because um, there is this question of like how high we can raise the cost to Russia of the empire expansion that you know all empires do, right? Not that it's just that it's horrible, it's awful. Um, but if you can raise the cost of that kind of invasion enough, maybe he won't go into Poland or whatever next. Um, and so from you know this kind of like I see this proxy war between the U.S. and EU and, and Russia being held in Ukraine. I just wonder what, you know, I mean, what you say to someone who's actually like in Ukraine, who has the perspective I think I would have if I was in Ukraine. It's not that I don't have a right to defend myself. It's that like, I, I don't think it's the right thing to do because it would have hurt my family, right? And it would hurt my future of the people around me. Um, so the issue with that is that I am not seeing that perspective coming from Ukraine. I mean, are you not like, is nobody saying that? Surely some people are like, I mean, I'm a small percentage, I'm 1%, but like, I would absolutely prefer to be Russian than go into any war in Ukraine. Like I would absolutely prefer it. And I know because my, my ancestors escaped from Russia, like I understand how bad that is. You know, it, it's really bad, but you do you understand what's gonna happen to like, I mean, you understand what's happened to people's lives in, in, in Ukraine too, right? Like yeah, but I listen, like when you actually listen to Ukrainians and when you hear what they're saying about this, including Ukrainian feminists, they have made it very clear that they do not wish to be Russian and they do not wish to be occupied because they've seen what it means and they've experienced the harm from it to their families and to their lives. So, for example, zero Ukrainian feminists um, signed the manifestos that I spoke about, and they actually keep writing about um, how Ukraine has the right to defend itself against an invasion. Okay, um, so I'm seeing some new hands up, which is great. Um, so if I just want to encourage all of you who are attending to think about questions or comments um, that you have, and then we'll circle back to some other questions and comments that people um, might be, the people who've already asked might have. So I see a hand, please do um, sort of join in. So first hand I see is, uh, I'm gonna try to say this, is it Yael? Please tell me how to say that name. Oh, that's great, thank you. Okay. Um, so I just, I just wanted to, um, I guess follow up on the point that, that that Nicole was trying to say. I think when uh, Nicole, when you said what you said, my, my I, I'm not an expert on Ukraine. I work mostly on the on the politics of language, and and one of the things that you constantly see is that we forced assimilation. That even if you even if you surrender your identity, you never you never really get to choose to be Russian. You're going to be put through you're going to be molded by someone else. Your children are going to be taken away by someone else. One of the most extraordinary clips, or I guess it's not so extraordinary for Teresa was, um, I think it was a Ukrainian legislature who, who um, was horrified that Ukrainian children can't speak Russian. So of course they have to be, uh, they have to be taken away from their families and be, and be brought up normal, right? There's a whole discourse about what, what does it mean to be like a normal, um, a normal person? A normal does does mean it, it's it strikes me in in this this entire conflict isn't that the problem that Putin has is not with with Ukraine uh, being this or that. It's Ukraine being right. It's it's being it it's having its own identity. It's being not Russia. Uh, there's no, I think there's no amount of uh, of uh, pseudo consensual 
steamrolling that could that could uh, make it legitimate in in any way. And again, I'm not an expert on, on Ukraine politics of language, but there's there are a lot of other contexts where we've seen the same the same things happening again and again, the same kind of cultural chauvinism and these idea that other people are only valid as people if we put them through the grinder of my of my identity. So it, even if you say I'm going to, I'm going to, don't worry, I'm going to be a Russian. It's not, you will not get a choice what kind of Russian you're going to be. You will, this, this completely, it just forced a simulation, right? There's resist any kind of, any kind of autonomy is going to be is going to be taken away it, it's it's i can't I, I can't think of something more dehumanizing i also can't think of something that is more um uh or i can't think of something but this it's very easy to see uh why this would um why this would connect with with uh with mental health issues right because it's not being being extracted from yourself is uh, is almost a sure way of of, of giving people uh, mood disorders, anxiety, depression, existential crisis, etc., etc., etc. This is I struggle to see how how any of that uh, is in any way justified. But sorry, I, 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 I'm gonna let because there is a way on way on that. Sorry for the for the rambling. No, thank you so much. That you really, you really um, grasped so many aspects of it, and it's also what's coming out of um, Ukrainian debates on this, but also more widely from the societies that have had their own experiences with um, occupations and and oppression um, from Russia and the kind of. You know, it's it always comes with suppression of culture, with um, imposition of Russian language, and sort of oppression of um, expression, and also of liberties. You know, um, Putin actually now even made um, speeches that really um, were met with a lot of um, critique and resistance from. Um, Russian feminists who are one of the most vocal and and uh, one of the most I guess dangerous um, uh, groups of um, sort of resistance towards the regime right now and they're actually right now the ones who are doing um, most organizing against um, against Putinism in, in Russia and I've been in contact with um, some people in in these struggles and they actually raised how um, Putin also framed this as a sort of missionary um, aggression against um, sort of anything else than traditional values, uh, which is very, you know, um, gender, um, like patriarchal sort of um, ultra patriarchal regime that will persecute any kind of um, existence beyond two gender binaries and you know traditional way of life and he actually framed it as as a sort of something he wants to um, promote around the world through uh, as a missionary force with violence and that that too should um concern us but I think it's also important to see the the responses with, uh, from countries that have been previously occupied beyond Ukraine the the societies absolutely understand what um what life under a Russian occupation is like and they're actually supporting Ukraine the most because they know <laughs> what what is at stake and what they also fear for themselves because no one wants to live under that again thanks <laughs> that's great um so i'm just going to just nudge a little bit um and sort of see if we can um <clears throat> so sorry what was i going to say i was going to say it's like i don't want this to become about a just mm. and unjust war mm. um mm. i think that there's a mm. lot of other stuff that's going on uh, that we could discuss so rio um did you want to chime in Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you so much, Teresa, for your excellent talk. It was just, I, I learned so much. Thank you for that. I was um, I was wondering about uh, the fate of the refugees. Um, mm. 
So in the context of the Syrian war, um, it was, I think it was 6.5 million of Syrian asylum seekers and refugees. Mm -hmm. And uh, within this 6.5 million refugees from the Syrian war, one million, uh, over one million were hosted by uh, European, European countries, but mostly by Germany, who took in, um, I think, 59% and 11% mm -hmm. of Sweden. Um, whereas in the context of the present war in Ukraine, I think at this state, there, there are 4.5 million refugees from uh, the Ukraine war. And, and, and a very astonishing fact that I learned recently is that 20,000 20, political refugees fleeing Russia uh, are also must also be counted in the numbers. However, the fate of the ref Russian refugees is very different because they are encountering all kind of, um, how can I say, ostracization uh, because they're Russian, even though they are fleeing persecution for the political uh, um, uh, objection to the Putin regime. But in any case, my question uh, pertains to the 4.5 million refugees from Ukraine and I gather that, uh, as you were saying, the buffer countries and Poland, for instance, uh, is welcoming um, thousand, if not million, of uh, refugees. But I was wondering, so how how, how are they faring in Europe, in, in Europe currently? Um, uh, are there novel uh, schemes of? Um, you know, of um, refugee installation in Europe. Um, I know that in Canada, we're beginning to, uh, to welcome Ukrainian refugees as well. Um, it, so do you have any kind of uh, information? Um, thank you. I'm trying to think if I am the most qualified person to answer this because I sort of, I know a bit, I think that from my colleagues who actually are more qualified, um, they keep complaining <laughs> about the schemes and how, how uh, for example, in um, I know that my colleague who works mostly in Slovakia and the Czech Republic, she says that uh, the system still works as if it assumed um, that the model of a refugee or a migrant is a young man. <laughs> and so there, um, is not sort of um, enough preparedness for the specific needs that um, women and women with children might have. So, for example, there's currently panic that there aren't enough school um, facilities and also childcare facilities. And um, there is a massive problem with um, schemes all across Europe that um, weren't thought through enough also with kind of like volunteer housing that they actually create situation that that puts um, women at risk of sexual exploitation and trafficking which has become really huge issue um in um in the last couple of weeks um and i saw that myself because i started volunteering in um the berlin refugee arrival center and that was one number one advice in the training that we need to absolutely viciously look out for um, men who actually specifically are looking for mothers with children so that they can keep the child and force the mother into um, a situation that she does not want to be in. Um, so this is this is what I know. I think that there also we've seen um, the issue of how uh, various countries got excited that they will have uh, cheap labor um, through um, Ukrainian refugees. Um, we saw that um, in, in, in Germany, um, um, companies were excited that uh, this will um, be a great labor force to pick up asparagus. Um, in the Czech Republic, we saw companies that wanted to use uh, overqualified Ukrainian women as uh, carers. In the UK, we saw calls that um, Ukrainians can apply to pick fruit and veggies. So it's this has been really um, also um, hugely problematic. And there are debates about how to actually ensure that um, people will be treated um, as um, those who are um, 
capable of other than um, low undervalued um, sort of um, labor and given some some fair opportunities. That's what I've been um, seeing a lot and yeah, I think that also um, I must say that the perception of um, Ukrainian women has been also problematic. I mean, th this is also what um, feminists from Europe's East have been raising for decades now, the kind of uh, construction of of women and femininity from, from that part of the world, how stereotypical it is and how often also it overlaps with um, the erasure of um, agency in, in, in debates on, on um, the position of women in society, because, for example, we know that we have numbers that um, scholarship of um, scholars from Europe's East is actually one of the most underrepresented types, types of scholarship in leading sociology and gender studies journals and textbooks. So um, this also... Um, erases the voices um, of um, Ukrainian and, and other women from uh, Europe seas from these debates on their own position. So I think this this is like I see the manifestation of, of that uh, stereotypical perspective on on Ukrainian women a lot and the expectations from them um, that um, are often. I yeah, think that uh, from I, I think that we absolutely need to empathize with the fate of the Ukrainian refugees. Uh, and what makes it even more tragic, however, is that obviously um, it doesn't take anything away from the misery and uh, and the pain and the suffering from the Ukrainian refugees. But evidently, when you compare with the fate of the Syrian refugees or the Yemen refugees uh, or, you know, uh, it's so uh, it, it it's so complicated. How uh, the I want to, mm -hmm. I also want to um, see the lessons from this of how to actually broaden this kind of you know solidarity because I think one what what's coming out of the way that um, the research also on why people are um, identifying or or responding to um, this situation more as one striking thing that I keep coming across is how in East Central Europe, there are such large um, Ukrainian migrant groups that it's basically hard to demonize people because everyone knows a Ukrainian. And there are large, large groups of Ukrainians living in those countries. And so I keep asking myself, how can we do this? Um, how can we bridge this, you know, when it comes to other refugees? And I, it, it keeps like... I'm concerned about how to do that on a continent where the media uh, dehumanized, um, you know, men from the Middle East and specifically Muslim men for the last decade. It was constant. How do you counter that? Because this is, you know, it's also very gendered. Like you look at Ukrainian women coming in and then the fear of, of you know, um, Middle Eastern or, or um, Muslim men that is completely incomparable to how we feel about, um, you know, Ukrainian, largely um, women refugees. Like, how do we um, actually counter um, these kind of, you know, also the, the pitting of like, just um, how do we counter all this to actually benefit all people who are fleeing? And that's really something I want to care about. Yeah, so but I wanted to say, if, if I can say one last thing, because I feel this is missing from the debate and I do not want to come across as someone who um, is not a pacifist, I would absolutely love if this invasion could uh, end with pacifism and also diplomacy. But sadly, we don't have any historical record of that ever working with Putin or, or Russia or the Soviet Union. So I would absolutely love pacifism if it worked. Great. Um, so with that, we are in the last minute. Um, and uh, I'm just going to take a prerogative and say t 30 seconds. Um, so Gabi um, had a question that I also wanted to add up on. So it's not a question. I'm just going to comment and then we're going to close it up. But basically, I think that there is lots of other things going on, which is that 
Um, so some of the largest public supporters of Putin are in India for mm -hmm. some reason. And then also Gabby was pointing to the fact that Latin, there's a lot of support for Putin and Russia in Latin America, partly because um, they see this in terms of anti-American imperialism. So this somehow there's sort of a balance to anti-American imperialism is somehow to support Russian aggression, which I just don't understand. But there's, I think, something else is going on or like Indians want to uh, appear that they are, you know, sort of going, you know, becoming independent and bigger in the world, and therefore they're going to have an independent, non-Western voice, and this is somehow a way to show that kind of uh, independence from the West, not uh, pro-Chinese, and so therefore allying with Russia or something like that. So I just wanted to say that there's also lots of other things going on. Um, but I think that your presentation today was uh, eye-opening. I, I want to thank you for that. I thought it was really, really informative. I also um, also think that there's huge numbers, not only of, uh, you know, what are the questions to end the suffering questions, but I think that there's significant uh, philosophical and conceptual issues at play here that uh, require addressing and that have so far not been really raised very well. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think that this has been a really great, um, at least for me, an, uh, an opening to sort of think about what are the different kinds of issues that we've been ignoring that require more attention. So I want to, on behalf of both institutions, I want to thank you for putting in all the hard work to provide us this presentation today and also taking our questions. Um, and Rioa, do you have anything to say as a final word? Well, no, you were so eloquent, eloquent, but I'll say it in French. Merci infiniment, Teresa, uh, pour cette conférence. C'était vraiment extrêmement, uh, extrêmement uh, éclairant et plus important et percutant. Uh, thank you so much. And we are very, very happy again to have hosted this collaboration with the Urge Group, uh, with having you, Teresa, as first guest speaker of the season. Thank you so much. Yep, and thank you. And hope, uh, we'll see, hopefully we'll see all of you again in two months time. So till then, be well and thank you. Bye-bye.